Hey there, 205. This is our third video for the sampling unit. And obviously there will be one fun thing because that's what we're doing now. So here we go. Um, in the last two videos, we talked about two different sort of umbrella types of samples. The probability samples, which use some sort of random selection or pseudo randomness in order to get representation amongst the population. And then we talked about non-probability samples. These do not use some type of random selection. So that was the last two videos. This video has a bunch of other stuff that's just important to know for sampling. So when we sample, I want you to imagine um, the Gallup organization trying to get presidential approval. Even if they call up you know, 5,000 Americans and get the average level of approval, does that mean that they have the exact average if they had like does that approximate the exact average of the entire population of the united states no it doesn't there is always going to be some level of discrepancy between an observed value i.e the sample and a true value i.e the population that arises because only a portion of the population is observed. And that is called sampling error, right? There's always some discrepancy between the sample and the whole population that you're trying to make inferences about. So how do we reduce sampling error? If you are doing random sampling, so those um, probability samples that we talked about in video one, if you're doing that, you can reduce sampling error by increasing your sample size, which should make sense intuitively. If your sample is this big, if it keeps growing and growing and growing, it's going to get towards the entire population, which just means that you're um, using a larger sample that represents more people. So increasing your sample size, if you are randomly sampling, gets rid of sampling error. The same is not going to be said for non-probability samples, right? If you do a snowball sample and you increase the sample size, that probably won't increase its representativeness. Um, you could just be increasing the bias, actually, if it started out in a biased way. Okay. So this is from a homework reading I am no longer giving you. I want you guys to imagine that we continuously take samples of 10 people in the United States. This is a sample size of 10. And we ask them something like, um, how much do you approve of Congress from a zero to a one, you can see that on the X axis and there's lots of decimals in between that. One is like perfect approval and zero is not at all. So if we sample 10 people uh, and then we find the average and then we plot the average. So if you go to the um, corner of the graphic here, it looks like about 50 samples of 10 people are averaging um, somewhere around zero. And then over here, you get about almost 200 samples of 10, averaging about 0.1. So you keep on taking samples of 10 and then distributing the averages. And you get this distribution, right? So this um, number down in the center here, p equals 0.25, that's the true value of the entire population. Let's say that is the, the United States entire average, 0.25. So this is what a distribution would look like if we keep on sampling groups of 10 and then plotting the average, okay? Let's go to the next one. Let's say we increased our sample size to 50 people, okay? So now we're sampling 50 people and then another 50 people and then another 50 people. When we start to plot those averages, you'll see that that graph starts to converge around the center where the actual population parameter is, 0.25. So now it looks like it's converging on that real number for the whole population. Let's go up another one. If we increased our sample size to 500 people, so a sample of 500 plot the average amount, 
a sample of 500 plot the average rating, a sample of 500 plot the average rating. Now we have a distribution that is really, really converging on that 0.25 number. It's very close. In fact, down here it says it is 0.25. So when we increase our sample size, we get closer to the actual population average if we are randomly sampling. However, there's one important thing to keep in mind. Increasing your sample size is good. However, you will hit a point where going to a higher sample number doesn't give you nearly as much bang for your buck. So going from you know, a sample size of one to a sample size of 100, that's gonna be a huge increase in your accuracy uh, when you're trying to represent an entire population. Going from 100 to 200, that's a huge increase in accuracy. So getting hundreds and hundreds more, that's really good. Getting thousands, that's great. Once you start to hit numbers like 10,000 people in your sample, 10,001 people in your sample, that level of accuracy is gonna start to taper off. You can see a diminishing marginal return. And since sampling is really expensive to conduct, you're gonna be putting in a lot of money for not that much payoff. So eventually this does become um, not really important to keep increasing your sample size. But once you get into the thousands, that's, that's really great sampling if you can do that. So there is sort of a limit to this. Okay, we're in the middle of the video. I want you guys to take a pen and I want you to write down this phrase. 205 online is life-changing. Just do it, write it down right now. It's gonna come back around in just a few minutes. Okay. I wanna talk about something that I see in politics, in sampling, in the real world a lot that you guys should watch out for, just so you are social science literate and politically literate. So here we have um, an article that was written in 2015 and it's called Bernie won all the focus groups and online polls. So why is the media saying that Hillary won the debate? Adam Johnson, some guy who wrote this article was very upset because people in the mainstream media had claimed that Hillary Clinton won uh, a presidential debate against Bernie Sanders. He says Bernie won all the online polls. So let's look at some of these online polls that Bernie Sanders won. So up here at the top, Huffington Post, it looks like 81% of people out of 45,000 you know, votes, that's a really high sample size, 81% that said that Bernie Sanders won this debate. If you go down to the bottom of the screen to Slate's poll, another 81% declared Bernie Sanders the winner. That's remarkably consistent to the um, Huffington Post poll. These are pretty large differences, 81% to 17%. Over here uh, on NewJersey.com's poll, it also looks like Bernie Sanders won 80% of the votes, and this is up in the thousands. Heavy.com, it looks like Bernie Sanders won 88.2% of the vote. This is very strange, right? We usually don't see really big discrepancies like that in public opinion. So what is going on here? Normally in class, I would ask you guys um, to sort of figure this out, okay? There's something very strange happening here. And it's not just something that's happening for Bernie Sanders in 2016. This very strange thing also happened for Ron Paul in 2012. Um, you kind of have to know a little bit of, about Ron Paul to understand um, why he's strangely similar to Bernie Sanders. Um, Ron Paul is a much more libertarian candidate. He is not very mainstream, like Bernie Sanders, and um, he has very, very dedicated followers, particularly young people like Bernie Sanders. So ideologically, really different. Bernie is very progressive. Ron Paul is very libertarian, so quite opposite. But a lot of times when online polls were conducted, they were winning them handedly, even though their support bases were fairly small. So 
Ron Paul, how a fringe politician took over the web. So there is um, something strange going on here. And you guys can probably figure it out on your own, but since I'm making a video, I'll just, I'll tell you. Um, when you have uh, candidates who are much more um, ideological or they're sort of different or they're sort of anti-establishment, they're going to have pretty strong support bases, even if those support bases aren't overwhelmingly large. And with these two in particular, they have really, really young support bases. Some of you might be Bernie Sanders or Ron Paul fans yourself. People that are younger tend to be on the internet a lot more often. And they might be taking these polls a lot more often than people who are, say, supporters of Hillary Clinton or Jeb Bush or even Ted Cruz. So what could be going on here, actually it's not what could be going on here, what absolutely is going on here is that when people take online surveys, which anyone are allowed to take on these websites, there's something that we call a self-selection bias taking place, right? There are people that go onto these websites that are younger, they're more internet savvy, they know that polls are going on, and they take them with great enthusiasm because they feel that their candidate who is not as mainstream is ignored a little bit by the media or ignored by the rest of the party and so they need to get their support out there by voting for them in online polls to keep their popularity up because they feel that their candidate is being slighted by the mainstream media so in in that way um, you should not take these polls seriously at all I wouldn't even say take them with a grain of salt. Just don't take them. Um, this is something that we see often. And here are some more examples of that, right? The Drudge Report is a pretty conservative website. It's kind of like the right-wing version of Huffington Post. Uh, so here they have a poll, who won the 11th Republican debate and in 2016? 69.15% of people, um, that's 59,000 or so votes, are saying Trump. Well, that's because the Drudge Report brings in a certain demographic to their own website and anyone can take those polls. So it's very likely that people who already really like Donald Trump are on those websites taking those polls. Let's look at some other fun internet stuff. Here's a website that you guys might be familiar with, right? Usually when I bring this up in class, everyone goes, oh my God, she knows about the website. I know, we all know about the website, right? Rate my professor. Some of you have used this before. I want you to think about who is more likely to use rate my professor, okay? And it doesn't take that much time to figure it out, right? You go on rate my professor and you rate us if you have an amazing experience and you want everyone to know about it, or if you have a terrible experience and you want everyone to know about it, right? Is it possible that at the end of 205, you will say, you know what, that was fine, and I'm gonna rate Dr. Amira online? Sure, that is absolutely possible, but it's much less likely to happen if you feel somewhere in the middle. So this website pulls in the extreme polar opposite ends of the spectrum, had a great experience or had a terrible experience. You guys might be familiar with this site as well. Yelp, we use Yelp to review lots and lots of stuff. Here we have our favorite um, nighttime establishment in Charleston, Mint. So we see that Frankie W. from Atlanta, Georgia had the worst time of his life at Mint, gave it one out of uh, five stars. But Corey R. from Somerville, South Carolina had an amazing time. Um, everyone was always friendly, they're always great. So I, I definitely cherry picked this one. Um, but you can see someone had a terrible experience, so they're rating it, and someone had an amazing experience. You don't see that many two or threes on Yelp as much as you see the fives or the ones. Let's check out some more examples. So these uh, ratings don't hold up as much these days. So this screenshot is from a few years ago. But if you were to go to Amazon and you would look at Hillary Clinton's book, Hard Choices, and Donald Trump's book, Great Again, look at how those ratings are distributed. 
right? We have the, what we call a bimodal distribution. Hillary Clinton is either getting five stars or one star. Donald Trump is either getting five stars or one star. So not only can anyone sort of go onto this website and review these books, even if they haven't read them, but it's also going to create an environment where people who want to express how much they loved Hillary Clinton's book or hated it, they're going to be more likely to go on to that site. Again, take this with a huge grain of salt, right? These are politicians and these are their book ratings. You are going to get a lot of people coming onto here who did not read these books, but they just want to cheerlead for a candidate that they like. And so they basically um, bombard sites like this with positive or negative reviews. Let's look at something else. Here are the IMDb average user ratings for six films from 2017. So take a look through at these films. You'll notice that one is not like the others, right? So when we look at the first five movies, they have a distribution in ratings that we consider to be a normal curve. A few people hated it, a few people liked it, and a lot of other people are in the middle. But what goes on when you go down to the bottom right and look at an inconvenient sequel, Truth to Power? So this is the follow-up to a movie by Al Gore called An Inconvenient Truth About Climate Change. Suddenly you have a ton of people giving this a terrible rating and a ton of people giving it the top rating and very few people in the middle. Now we have a really bimodal distribution. This is happening because this is a political movie and it's drawing in people that want to put their partisanship or their politics into the review rating and say that they hate it or that they love it to express their politics. So here is the phrase that you should learn from this. It's called self-selection bias. Self-selection bias is when respondents who opt into a sample entirely on their own have similar qualities and that biases the sample, right? When we randomly sample someone, they're not coming into the sample on their own, we are randomly choosing them. So they shouldn't have systematic similarities to one another. But when you're allowed to opt into a sample, like we see with the online polls for Bernie Sanders and Ron Paul and Yelp and Rate My Professor, that's self-selection. People are choosing to be in that sample. A vast majority of groups and associations in life are self-selecting. So for example, you self-selected into the College of Charleston as a student. You weren't randomly chosen to come to this school. You self-selected. That means everyone at C of C has certain similarities about them, even if they aren't overwhelming similarities, right? Maybe most of you are from South Carolina. Maybe most of you have a certain type of family background or a certain type of family history. There's a self-selection mechanism going on there. Most of you self-selected into political science as a major. We didn't randomly choose you to get a representative sample of the population. You self-selected in. You guys are more interested in governance and politics and policy and power than the average person at the college. So that's a self-selection bias. Many people self-select into their professions or jobs. People that become doctors have certain personality traits that are going to be similar on average. People that go into, I don't know, um, art, they're going to have certain personality traits that are similar on average. If you're part of an email distribution list, you self-selected into that. So pretty much every association that we make is self-selecting. So that's something that you guys need to be on the lookout for, right? When you see something like this, when you see Donald Trump tout uh, an impeachment poll from Breitbart.com, which is um, a website that is basically a propaganda outlet for Donald Trump. They are heavily invested in his candidacy. When they poll 
the people that go to that website, when they say, do you stand with the president during impeachment, yes or no, and 97.83% of people say, yes, we stand with Donald Trump, that's because the people that go to that website are already hardcore supporters of Donald Trump. It's self-selecting into a website where people have similar characteristics. This does not represent anything remotely close to the population. The self-selection bias here is very, very strong. So anytime that you see online polls or anything like that that you can choose to be in, don't take them seriously whatsoever. They are pretty, they're fun, but they're pretty much meaningless. So I wanted you guys to understand that conceptually so you could look out for it in the real world. And now it's time for one fun thing. Here's your one fun thing. Send me the code word or code phrase that you wrote down earlier and I'll give you half a bonus point on your final grade. Email this to me ASAP. I want it within the week, okay? So by Sunday night at midnight. Don't tell other people you earned this. You watched the whole video. You earned it. So that's your one fun thing. See you next time.